I'm here today to talk about configurations. Um, and I'm not sure about you, but I don't think configurations is the like, most exciting topic to talk about. It's actually quite boring. But so you might wonder why I'm here talking about it at all. Uh, and it turns out that configurations are an essential part of almost every application. And it's so important to get right. Uh, so important that we can have disastrous results if we get it wrong. So the question to you is like, by show of hands, how many of you have ever had a configuration issue in production, like ever, right? So that's like pretty much all of you, right? And if you're not showing your hand, I probably want to talk to you because that just doesn't happen, right? Uh, so truth is, it happens to almost everyone, whether you remember it or not. Uh, and in the past, I've been very frustrated with the state of configurations, so much that I wrote my own library to improve the situation. And you could say that I'm on a mission to make configurations better. Uh, and I'm here today to tell you about my journey with configurations, to show you how Sirius works, and most importantly, how we can make configurations easy, safe, and secure again. All those boring, nice to have things that you want. Uh, I also literally have no slides, so I'm just gonna do live coding instead, and you can watch me miserably fail with that. Um, so let's say you've been tasked with writing this very important enterprise application, right? So the business has figured out that a core part of their platform is gonna be this Calsay application. Now I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Calsay, but I'm gonna show you how it works. Uh, so we have our code here. I'm using IO app from Cats Effect. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about IO, but uh, if you're going to Scala X this year, there's uh, going to be a talk from Gabriel about it, uh, which I can highly recommend. Uh, so we're using the original Calse application, and we created a functional wrapper around it. So what Calse allows us to do is we can give it a message. So let's say, please stop using configuration files. And we can give it some customizations. So we can say, maybe I want the eyes to be wired. That, that's what you want. And maybe we want a tongue. It can be a U, maybe. And we're going to set a max with 230 columns. And what's really cool is you can nest these. So you can, I can create a second cow, say, here. And I can give it the first one. And we can say, I don't want any max width on this one. So the first one just fits. And I want this to show with a different file. I want to show it with a dragon. Right. OK. And then we're just going to print this out to the console. And when we're done, I'm just going to say, let's claim that to be a success. OK, so that's our application. Let's take a look at how it runs. Just waiting for the compiler. OK. So when we run this guy, we get a little, let's see him out a little bit. We get a cow here saying, please stop using configuration files. And inside here, we get, a, um, we get it inside another bubble where it's a dragon saying that the cow is saying something. So this is, this is the cow say application. It's an old Perl script, and we're just using it as an example uh, throughout this talk. Um, let's see now. So I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. So of course, it wouldn't be an enterprise application unless this was served over a REST API, right, as a microservice. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm just going to run the HTTP implementation of this just to show you how it works. So that's hopefully running. And what we can do now is we can say, get the local host, say, Cal, say we can give it a message, for example, hello. Oh. Right, and we get a response back, which is just exactly what I showed you before with the message. And it supports customization options and all those nice things you want. So you've written this application, and you're pretty happy with it. Um, you put it up for code review, maybe. Your colleague comes saying there's a few magical values in the code. So um, if we go into the HTTP implementation here, which is not terribly important on its own. He says there are some magical values here, like the port you bind to and what host you want to bind to. So he calls these magical values, right? In fact, they're constant configuration values. And he says you should move these out into a config file so he doesn't really have to dig around in the code to figure out how to change these values. 
And he says the configuration files are pretty standard and he always uses it and it allows him to change values without having to recompile the software. And before you know it, he's already gone ahead and done the work for you. So we're gonna take a look at what he's done. Um, so if we take a look at the config here, he's created a config file here in application contest using type safe config or lifepan config or whatever you want to call it these days. Um, so we have a config file here. We see him move the host and port out into the config file and he introduced some HTTP idle timeout. I don't really know why, but it's there. And then we have some syntax here which reads environment variables and system properties um, in case they're as kind of an override. And in the code, we have this config class which kind of wraps this config file, right? Um, and after we take a look at this, we can spot a few issues almost immediately. So uh, if any of these type conversions fail, right? If you say config get int um, and it's not an int, that, that will fail with an exception, right? And if we forget to specify a value in our config file, we'll also get an exception. And these exceptions are not uh, raised until we actually call these functions because they're definitions, right? Uh, so that means that could happen much later in your program. And in the literature, these errors are known as latent configuration errors. Um, and these kind of errors, we just fix here by making these valves, but there are other um, other latent configuration errors as well. We're also using quite permissive types here, so uh, an int might not um, be a good type to represent port numbers, because not every int is a port. Um, and also, not every string might be a valid host that you can bind to. We're also performing quite a lot of side effects, and that's not really represented here. For example, when we load the config file, uh, we're writing quite a lot of boilerplate, so for every value, we have to write something in in our object here, right? Um, and we duplicate the namespace or at least the um, the uh, inner um, inner path in our config file. Uh, and we would tie the config to the way it's being loaded, right? So we we have a config file and we have a config class which looks kind of exactly how the config file looks like, but it also has the the um, decoding and loading logic built inside. So we we have not separated those very cleanly. Um, and to ensure that these values we have in the config file can actually be used, we need to have a test, right? You have to write a unit test to actually load this file and make sure that works. And I've never seen anyone actually test their configuration. So if you say you do, I probably don't believe you. So the bottom line is, this is what I call a configuration time bomb waiting to explode. And this talk is going to be about how we can fix this. So you decide to tackle these issues, and perhaps you find a little library called Pure Config, uh, which helps you decouple what you're loading from how you're loading it. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So this is already quite nice. Now we have a, uh, a couple of case classes, which is just the pure data that we've loaded, this is our entire configuration. And from pure config, we just get this load config function where you give it a namespace and it will figure out how to load everything else. So that's already quite nice. We've separated what we're trying to load from how it's being loaded and pure config does the hard work for us here. Um, so we don't have to think about conversion errors or missing keys. Uh, that's all handled for us and turned into errors. Uh, the configuration values are loaded up front, so we get less surprises further down in our application. No more boilerplate, and yes, yeah, said we'd separate what from how. However, there are still a couple of issues here. Uh, we're still using quite permissive types, so we still have int for port numbers, which is perhaps not a good type for port numbers. And we still need a test to verify that these values we have in the config file are, are still valid. So still a good, good way to go, right? So um, one way you can solve, um, solve having these permissive types is to use something called refinement types. So I'm just going to skip ahead and show you how that looks like. 
So if you're not too familiar with refinement types, the basic idea is you have a type and you say refined and then you give it a predicate. So that's a description of which string values are actually valid IPv4 addresses, for example, for, for, for the host. And for port, we have some predefined aliases in refined, so you can have a user port number, and that's integers um, that are in a certain interval. And if you inspect, you can see it's 1024 to 49151, which is actually the numbers you as a user are kind of allowed to use normally. Um, so that's pretty nice. We got more restricted types, and we can prevent some invalid variants uh, from being used as values. But we still need to have a test just to make sure that these values are valid, right? Um, so you're not entirely happy with this. I'm not entirely happy with this. Uh, but we'll leave it as is for now. So the next day, maybe your colleague who did a code review, he lets you know that we're going to have to deploy this application to multiple environments. So there's going to be a testing and production environment. And there's also a new requirement to have a secret key to access the API just because we need to prevent abuse of this Kelsey service. So he tells you you can't really put secrets in the repository source code because that can easily get into the wrong hands and we don't really have any auditability of what's going on there. Uh, but what he says you can put them as a Kubernetes secrets because we're using Kubernetes and you could fetch them from there. And then you can use an environment variable, maybe you can override, uh, override that secret when you're running locally. Uh, and to support multiple environments, you can make a copy of the config file and you can change the values to suit environment. And maybe you can use an environment variable to figure out which file to load. And if you're like me, you're starting to feel the kind of limitation of configuration files here. Uh, you're supporting multiple environments is a bit of a pain. There's quite a lot of duplication. Um, and even though you use configuration files, you have to support multiple sources. So you have Kubernetes secrets, you have environment variables, and you have a, your configuration file. And then you have to think about things like decoding kind of these string values into other types. And you have to handle errors, maybe accumulate them, um, so you can see everything that went wrong at once. And extra care must be taken when dealing with secrets, right? We wanna, don't want to persist them, and we don't want to log them for sure. And at this point, it feels like your head's going to explode, or that's how my head feels, uh, at least. And you're thinking there must be a better way to do all this. And that's when the idea hits you, and the answer is configurations as code. So if you go back to thinking about reasons why we used configuration files in the first place, was because we could change values without having to recompile the software. But actually, if you think about it, the way we do things is we always push configuration changes as git commits, right? And the CI will rebuild and deploy the application uh, after it's been pushed. So we never really take advantage of the main reason for using configuration files. So why should we even use it at all then? Uh, and this is where Sirius comes in. Um, so I'm just going to remove this pure conflict dependency and rewrite what we saw with configuration files, but just using Sirius to show you the kind of equivalent. So we'll start by just importing Sirius, and we're going to use refinement types. So Sirius has a refined integration that you can use. Um, and our load function is going to return an either. So we'll either have configuration errors, whatever that means, or we'll have an instance of our config. And then Sirius has us one function to do this is called load config. And it accepts a number of things you'd like to load. Um, so we're going to start with loading an option. So there might be a, um, a host specified as an environment variable. It might not be there. So we say option. And then we're going to give the name of the environment variable. So that might be HP host. Right? And then we'll do the, the same thing for the other ones, just to get the equivalent of a config file. So use the port number is maybe port. And then we have one more, which is the final integration. And maybe that's the idle timeout. OK. So that's everything we want to load. Some of these things might not be there. 
and then we get a function that says, what if we had all of these values? Um, maybe they're not there, maybe they're there. What are we gonna do with them? So we'll get a host, we'll get a port, and we'll get an idle timeout. And now the idea is that we create our config using these values. So let's create a config. And inside it, we have a HP config. And the host is going to be our host, but that's an option, so it might not be there. So let's just say get or else. And maybe we'll just use uh, some default on all interfaces. And the port also might not be there. So let's just say port 9000, maybe. And then we have the idle timeout. Same thing, might not be there. Um, so it's not, let's say, 20 seconds. Um, so now you might be thinking, why is IntelliJ not happy? And that's because this is a string, right? But for our host, we said that was going to be a refinement type. Um, and a string is not necessarily an IPv4 string. But a really nice thing about Refine is it gives us a compile time verification of literals. So Refine can tell us if this is a IPv4 string at compile time. And all we have to do is we have to import the Refine auto macro. And this is almost happy. At the end, we're just going to say result. And it should be happy, yeah. So Refine will check these values at compile time. and if they're not conforming to the predicates, then we're gonna get a compile error. So that means we no longer have to have tests just to make sure that our constant values, which were in a config file before, are valid. This, that'll get checked for us. So that's pretty nice. I'm just gonna roll and there we go, same thing. Okay. So now we have that extra requirement that we wanted an API key to uh, prevent abuse of the service and we're gonna deal with multiple environments. So I'm gonna start with the API key. So for the API key, we just add one more thing into our HTTP config, and I'm gonna wrap the API key with a secret. So secret is type from series that marks uh, another type as secret. Uh, and that means a couple of things, and I'll get back to them in a, in, in a moment. Uh, API key is a type alias we have for a refinement type. So that's just a string which matches some regex here. It's an alphanumeric string with between 25 and 40 characters. So you can find these refinement types on your own as well. So we added the secret to the HP config, and we're going to change our load function to read this um, API key as a Kubernetes secret. So Citrus has a Kubernetes integration with Kubernetes secrets. And there are other integrations as well for different vault services. So we're going to import uh, Sirius Kubernetes. And we're going to be using IO from CatSpect here. So Sirius has a CatSpect integration. So we'll import that as well. Um, so our load will no longer return either config errors or config. It will just return an IO of config. And then we'll let any errors just be a part of that IO. No. Okay. Yes, there we go. I happen to know we're going to need a, a context shift here. It's also from Cat's effect. Um, context shift IO. We still keep our load config, but we're gonna have to do a few more things. So in Sirius Kubernetes, we can create a API client to fetch Kubernetes secrets. I'm just gonna use the default one here. And say IO, okay. So that gives us our API client. Uh, and then we can load, specify the namespace we wanna load secrets from. And I'm just gonna use secrets here as a generic secret store. I'm gonna pass in the API client, okay. So now we have everything we need to load Kubernetes secrets. Um, we're just going to load our config. We use load config just like before. Um, and now we're gonna have environment override. So let's say, um, we say, let's try to load a secret API key. 
from an environment variable called API key. And NBEF here just means we load with IO instead of nothing, essentially. And if it's not there, well, then we can just say or else. So maybe I want to use something else if it's not there. And I can just say secret and we'll load an API key. So either there's going to be an environment variable called API key, or if it's not there, we're going to use a Kubernetes secret instead. So this shows you how we can compose sources quite easily uh, to fit your requirements. And if that works successfully, we'll get an API key out here. And we can create our config uh, just like before. So for the config, we have a HTTP config. And it's got the same values as before. This was 9,000. We have an idle timeout, 20 seconds, and our API key is API key. And then we can say, I want to raise this as an error in IO if it's not there. And then we just yield the config. And these values I'm putting here, this uh, host port and idle timeout, we were actually never interested in loading these from environment variables or system properties. So I just let them be constant values in here. Um, so it turns out we never actually needed that. So I'm just going to remove that code. So now we have something that loads uh, that secret. And you can, if you want to test it locally, you can use an environment variable. And then in testing and production, we can use a Kubernetes secret instead. So that's the first requirement. Second one is to deal with multiple environments. And I probably don't have time to code all that up for you, but I'm going to show you how it looks like. So first, first of all, we need to have a way to model environments in our application. Uh, and one of the nicest ways to do that, I think, is to use enumerations. So there's a great library called Enumeratum for Scala that um, helps you model enumerations in a, in a good way. And how this works is you just create a sealed trait or abstract class, and you send from this enum entry. And then in the companion object, you have a enum of that same type. And then you just define case classes or case objects for your enumeration. And then this little bit is just to uh, a macro that finds these two values for you and puts them in, in a vector in this case. So this allows us to get all the values by just calling dot values here, right? The nice thing is Cirrus has a, an Emiratum integration. So you don't have to write any decoding logic to figure out which environment you're in. And by default, you'll get um, decoding, which de decodes this exact string as the testing environment and this exact string as the production environment. Um, and then the way we can load this is we just put another thing here in our load config. We say, I want to load an app environment from this environment variable. And we get another parameter uh, to our function down here. And then we can use that in our config to do whatever we want. So maybe you want to use different values um, in different environments. And in this case, all you have to do is match on the environment. So you can say, if I'm in the testing environment, maybe I want a shorter idle timeout for some reason. And in production, I want a longer one. Right? So it allows you to do that kind of thing. Um, so I thought we should run this, see how it actually looks like. Hopefully, it will. Some warnings. Things trying. Okay, good. So when we run, run this application, uh, we got an exception from Sirius saying there are, it, our configuration failed to load and there were some errors. So you see we're missing the environment variable here and for the environment, and we're missing the API key. And you can see it's also tried to load the Kubernetes secrets, but that's also missing. So it gives you error accumulation in, in both per individual value from multiple sources and all the values you try to load. So you get all the errors at once. Um, so I thought we exit out and actually try to set this up and let's try and set it to testing. And in the meantime, I am going to create a Kubernetes secret that we can try to load. So 
this just creates a Kubernetes secret, I thought. We should create the, the namespace. So now we have a, a Kubernetes secret. The value is going to be ABC. That's our, our secret. And I'm going to try to run again. So we can see, once again, we've gotten some errors. The, uh, the app environment has now been set, because we set it as an environment variable uh, when we loaded SPT. And now we can see what's happened with the API key. It says, we're missing the environment variable, but the Kubernetes secret is there. But um, it cannot be converted to this type. And this is the refinement type that we wrote ourselves. It says, I, I don't know how to, this value is not a valid uh, according to this type. And you can see, because we wrapped it in secret, it actually redacts the value in the error messages. So that's one of the things you get with by wrapping secret. Uh, sensitive details in your error messages get redacted automatically. So you don't have to think about that yourself. Uh, so let's try to make a valid, um, valid key instead. So I'm just going to delete the old one called API key. Uh, let's just create something like that. Hopefully, that should be valid. Let's try and run again. So that seemed to have worked. Um, I printed the config here, and I'll explain uh, soon what that means. But you can see we get the config printed here. You can see the values we put as, as constant values in our code. And you can also see that the API key is printed. But instead of printing the API key, we print this secret wrapper. And this thing here is a SHA-1 hash of your secret value. Uh, it's the first seven, I think, characters. Um, so what this allows you to do is you can take your secret, you can run the SHA-1 hash on it, and then compare it with these to make sure that you actually have the secret you expect. And this allows us to have something output, but we're not outputting the secrets anywhere. So you can log your configuration, and you don't have to worry about any secrets being exposed. But you can still check that the secrets are the ones you expect. Um, cool. And the way this works is it uses uh, the show type class in cats together with a product called kittens, which provides derivation of these show instances. So show you can think of a bit like to string, but in a type class. So as long as you know how to call to string or show on every type in your config, kittens will basically give you a show for your whole case class. And it has pr show pretty, which basically gives you something that looks like this, kind of how you would type it out. So it becomes quite easy to read. And it's quite useful to just log when you start your application. So there are two more important features of series I'd like to show. Uh, and again, I won't have time to write them out, but um, I'm going to show how they look like. So one thing you can do is you can load your configurations in steps and then gradually compose them into larger configurations. So in this case, I've added a database config. For some reason, we decided we want to store these cal generated calces. And username is just non-empty string. And the secret is some kind of database password that's also secret. So what you can do is I can load my HTTP config depending on some values here. But I can load that config, create a HTTP config, um, and the environment has been loaded before, so it's just coming from somewhere. And this secret just allows me to load Kubernetes secrets, exactly what we saw before. And same code as before, we load an environment variable or we load a Kubernetes secret. We can do the same with a database config, so maybe that's just loaded from a Kubernetes secret. And then we can compose them together by, by just putting them into another load config block. So here we just have the HTTP config and the database config. We compose them together again with load config, and we create an, our final config. So, so that gives us quite a nice modular composition. Um, and the second feature, which is also worth knowing about, is this with value construct. 
So if you have part of your configuration which depends on other values, so let's say in this case, we're loading the environment we're in first, and we say, well, if I don't know what environment I'm in, I'm not going to be able to load the rest of my configuration. Then you can use with value, which basically loads all the values in here, exactly how a load config works. But in the uh, in this second function you pass in, you can actually keep using load config and keep loading your configuration later on. And you can see that here in HTTP config where we pass in the environment. So it actually needs the environment um, to uh, derive this idle timeout thing. So yeah, that was basically the, the basics of Cirrus. I just want to recap. Um, so we've essentially made configurations easy by writing them as code. There is no need to use a separate configuration syntax you can't remember. And you can just hopefully write Scala as you know it. Uh, we made configuration safe by validating our configuration values up front, either at compile time, ideally, or at runtime using refinement types. And we've made configuration secure by loading secrets from vault services like Kubernetes secrets and by loading values from multiple sources in a uniform way. And we've shown how we can redact sensitive details in error messages and how we cannot log secret values but still print our configuration. And we've done all of this without writing any decoding logic whatsoever. And we've accumulated errors, both for composing multiple sources and multiple values. Uh, so hopefully you'll agree this is a sane approach to configurations. Uh, and I hope you find it useful. If you want to know more about Cirrus and what I've been talking about today, uh, there's quite extensive documentation at the website. Uh, it's cir.is, and you can go read about a lot more about what I've been talking about. Um, the Scala doc is also quite extensive. Um, and that's, yeah, I think that was everything I had. Yeah. Are there any questions? Okay. There is uh, someone working on a um, vault service, HashiCorp vault. Um, I'm not sure what the progress is, but yes. As people need them, people will write them, probably. Yes. There is one for that. There is a list, I think. So we have a couple as well. It's Credstash. You made it for a parameter store. Um, we have one very specialized for setting up Kafka with our provider. Um, yeah. So it's it's quite extensible, and you can write your own integrations. Um, it's also plenty of integrations for Cirrus and more for decoding logic. So we have Enumeratum we mentioned. We have Generic, which implements shapeless support, so you can decode. Um, products and case classes. Um, we have Spire, which is uh, new number types for Scala, and Squonks, which is units of measurements libraries. You can load things like degrees and yeah, such things. Cool. I think that's it. Thank you.